Uh, I had a personal introduction to our infrastructure problems this morning, probably the way many of you did. I took Amtrak down from New York City, and uh, because of a delay, a broken down train ahead of us, we were a little delayed. I was on the cell phone and it cut off about a dozen times. And I'm going to have a hard time reading my notes because the train was so jittery. Uh, I think in contrast to that, uh, a different infrastructure system uh, in China where NRDC is working to clean up, among other things, the air and the water. As you probably know, about 30% of air pollution in California now often comes in from China. And there you can hop on a train, it goes 300 kilometers an hour, the cell phone works perfectly, and it's absolutely smooth and you can read your handwriting. And so I was struck again that that's the type of infrastructure the United States should have, and really there's no reason we can't have it. Uh, yet this morning, many of you heard from a panel talking about infrastructure, and the bottom line was our infrastructure gets a D. Uh, well, actually I think it was a D plus, uh, although I'm not sure that makes much of a difference. Uh, and it's clear that we have to do much better. You heard this morning about the need for building infrastructure to not only uh, improve climate resiliency, but also to improve the quality of life of all the communities. Now we're going to talk about the job implications of focusing on rebuilding our infrastructure. These are direct jobs, such as making and laying pipes, such as building and upgrading our energy generation, distribution, and transportation system, our transit and transportation systems, retrofitting buildings to make them more energy and water efficient and more affordable. But it also includes jobs upstream all along the whole supply chain, the steel and the aluminum industry, among others. But fixing our in infrastructure also can provide benefits and jobs downstream, making Americans more productive and therefore increasing our competitiveness and providing even greater opportunity for American jobs, markets, and, op and opportunity. And it's not just jobs that we create, it's money that we can save that then can be used for good purposes. A recent study by the American Public Transportation Association found that the average person could save almost $10,000 a year by switching to public transit if it worked, were available, and were in good shape. And think of the productivity and quality of life gains if it's easier to get to a wider range of jobs or goods can be moved quickly and reliably without getting stuck in traffic. The good news here is that the federal government has now seen this in part. They recently gave an $886 million grant, their largest ever, to the New York City MTA, which employs 65,000 people and moves more than a million people every day. But fixing infrastructure itself can not only make can our communities more resilient to climate change, but can also reduce climate change. Reducing methane leaks, for example, from the natural gas system, as is happening through EPA's Natural Gas Star program, creates jobs, improves local air quality, and slows climate change. That's the type of program we can all be supporting. But there's one type of job that, with all due respect, we don't want to increase too much, and that is in unnecessary health care jobs. And fixing our infrastructure can also keep us healthy. I think we all just heard Gina McCarthy speaking about how clean air, clean water systems can keep us healthy and keep us out of hospitals in the first place. Yet our drinking water and our sewage systems are in dire need of repair, and ensuring that our clean waters are protected can save hundreds of millions of dollars each year. We'll all have a chance to comment on a draft EPA rule on this coming up soon. So fixing our infrastructure will take everyone working together, all levels of government, labor, the private sector, NGOs. And the good news for all of you is today we have an all-star cast to help talk about this issue. Joining me today uh, to address the infrastructure angle from all sides. You probably all know Leo Girard. He spoke earlier today. He's the international president of the United Steelworkers, a union I think I saw many of you here. Welcome. Since he became international president in 2001, Leo has really led the charge to bring manufacturing back here to the United States and has fought to win clean energy jobs for everyone. 
He's also been a real leader in the creation of this organization, the Blue-Green Alliance, for which we all owe him a real personal thanks. Makes me nervous when you guys clap for me. <laughs> to Leo's right, Kevin McKnight is the Chief Sustainability <laughs> Officer and Vice President for en Environment, Health, and Safety for Alcoa. Alcoa is the third largest aluminum producer in the world and a leader in the efficient use of water and energy and, mi and in minimizing wastes. Next to him, Mike Raywinkle is the Executive Chairman of Evraz North America, the leading steel manufacturer in the, on the continent. Before being uh, executive chairman, he was also CEO uh, of Everaz, and before that, at Georgia Pacific and International Paper. So, as I said to him earlier, when he plays rock, paper, scissor, he's got at least two of those covered. <laughs> <laughs> and, and last, uh, but certainly not least, Dr. Kathleen Rust is the executive director of the Union of Concerned Scientists, an alliance of over 400,000 citizens and scientists all focused right now very strongly in leading the charge on addressing climate science and moving us forward on climate solutions. Prior to UCS, Dr. Rust was at the Center for Disease, uh, Center for Disease Control. And welcome to all of you. So I'm going to be asking a few questions of our panel, uh, and I think we'll have a good interchange. So earlier this morning, Kathy, we heard about the dire strait of the infrastructure. When it comes to adapting to and mitigating the worst effects of climate change, why is it so important that we focus on infrastructure? And what stress, in particular, is climate change putting on our infrastructure? So here, here's what we know. Climate change is happening. Communities all across the country are already experiencing the impacts that are associated with this new reality that we're facing. I'm sure that all of you out there have either experienced some extreme weather events, extreme heat, drought, wildfires, sea level rise, and flooding. And the science tell us that these impacts will continue and probably even get worse in the decades that are coming. And so these kinds of impacts pose really serious threats to our infrastructure. So I'll give you just a couple of examples. Let's look first at our energy infrastructure and the reliability that we come to depend on from our electricity system. So we know that strong storms can damage power plants, transmission lines, and disrupt fuel supply infrastructure. We know that flooding uh, due to sea level rise, uh, storm surge, or extreme precipitation uh, leaves our utilities vulnerable. We've seen this. We saw it uh, loud and clear with Hurricane Sandy. Heat and drought are already putting pressure on our electricity supplies. Some of you may have experienced this, but you may have read about the fact that many of our fossil fuel power plants and our nuclear plants have already had to shut down or scale back production due to either water shortages or high temperature in the water um, too high for cooling. Uh, those of you from uh, the West have probably seen the wildfires, which can cause a lot of physical damage to our, trans our transmission lines that carry our electricity for really long distances. So these kinds of impacts can lead to really dangerous and costly shutdowns and blackouts in our energy sector. If we look at transportation, uh, we can see, again, if you lived in Colorado, you probably experienced it uh, just this past summer, with flooding that damages our roads, our bridges, our railways, greatly impacting land-based transportation. Sea level rise can also affect shipping, shipping routes, ports, uh, our marine infrastructure, and flooding can also um, impact air transport systems depending on where they're located. Uh, if we look at our water infrastructure, what we see with climate change and will continue to see is that we're either going to have too much water or we're going to have not enough water. So we have seen how increased precipitation can overwhelm st uh, storm water and sewage infrastructure really posing grave threats 
to health uh, and the environment of our communities across the country. So what I can say is the, these threats are real, these threats are serious, and that it's critical that we begin building a, an infrastructure that's resilient to these kinds of climate change impacts. Um, it, it takes money to do these things, but the cost of inaction is enormous. Uh, the cost will only get higher the longer we wait. Thank you, Kathy. So turning to you, Leo, uh, your member is oral and manufacturing, and we're not having enough of it. What are some of the federal solutions that can help reinvigorate our infrastructure system? For example, the infrastructure bank, will that help? Of course. The uh, number of things that could be done, uh, first of all, we ought to quit giving tax breaks to companies that move jobs offshore. I couldn't think of any more stupid. <laughs> Secondly, we should have quit signing trade deals to give our jobs away. I'm not. Uh, I'm, none of our members are opposed to trade. We think trade is an important thing, but we ought to have a balanced trade approach. And our uh, employers and, and multinational employers, not necessarily the two that are sitting to my right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, mm. I told Kevin I get a little nervous when I hear the Alcoa uh, clapping for me. I just, you know. <laughs> but but all, all kidding aside, that uh, you know, if having if, if having a huge trade deficit was a good thing, then I have a very simple question: Why does no other nation want one? And and that those huge trade deficits have given away our jobs. So now to come back to your question. The, the, the importance of the infrastructure to us and an infrastructure bank that Rosa Delora has been promoting for a long time, and I think we ought to try to give it some meaningful support, is that you take a minimal amount in relative terms of federal dollars and you create a bank and you get to leverage that money with private sector money. And it's, it's believed that for about $25 billion over time, that could be leveraged to almost $550 billion a year. That $550 billion would be wonderful for targeting it over an extended period of time at our infrastructure. And uh, some of the, the, the uh, Society of Civil Engineers have calculated that for every billion dollars spent on infrastructure, you create about 18,000 jobs. So if you multiply that number into the number of jobs that you get, it's, uh, it's a huge number. <laughs> My next comments are sort of a retread to what I've said last night and again this morning. Uh, we have, I'm just making a list of, uh, of sort of the, the obvious infrastructures. We got over 4,000 dams in America that are already deficient. And if you get some of the stuff that we just talked about, if you get too much rain, those dams are going to overflow. They're not going to be able to hold. And so what's the response that was been to that? People living downstream from these dams are being asked to pay higher flood insurance rates, which is, again, kind of stupid, instead of fixing the dams. Uh, we have the majority of our schools now are more than 60 years old. Our kids are in an environment that could be a lot improved in those schools. Our grid, our transportation, or our electric grid loses 10 to 15 percent of the energy you put on the grid. Uh, our uh, natural gas pipeline infrastructure is insufficient and a direct example that will affect some of our members that are in fact in this hall. Up in the New England area, the uh, gas infrastructure provisions, or pipeline, I mean, can't hold and can't deliver enough capacity for the demand. So in New England, in Maine, as an example, on uh, the, the, the lack of being able to deliver gas, gas in Maine is $70 per mm of uh, BTU. That wow. same gas, if you were selling it in Louisiana, where they've got lots of gas infrastructure, is $4. So what will that do to our paper mills? It'll end up that our paper mills and some of the, Kevin will know, some of our mills that were in Alcoa that had energy costs that would drove them out of business, that will drive them out of business. And some smart ass says to me, well, they can just move down south where the gas is cheaper. The problem with that is you've got to go where the trees are. You've got to go where the fiber is. And then you want sustainable forest products, so you don't want people going down in areas and out of desperation clear cutting. So everything is tied together. And I could go through, we have a, as you pointed out, Amtrak, it's a mess. Uh, so you go through all of the infrastructure that we have in America, 
And if we can find a way to kickstart that, if we can make this the issue, and we're not going to tackle income inequality unless we rebuild the industrial base of America. It's a fallacy to think you can do rebuild the inf or that you can fix inequality without making things in America. So my last point is, if we're going to do infrastructure, we're going to do it with tax dollars, then every tax dollar that's spent should be made buying American-made products so we put American workers back to work. So many opportunities. I will say that in some place I've heard people actually downstream of dams being asked not only not to pay higher insurance, but to move, mm -hmm. uh, which is even worse. Uh, Kevin, a lot of our infrastructure is going to be built out of aluminum, uh, and yet aluminum is a big industry with its own footprint. And but you guys have been real the leaders in sustainability. So tell us about that and, and aluminum's role and sustainable manufacturing in the in infrastructure. Well, first of all, we're a manufacturing company. We make stuff, and we've been contributing to sustainable infrastructure solutions for about 125 years, ever since we invented the process for making aluminum. Aluminum is really a fantastic material for sustainable infrastructure. Um, its lightweight, its strength, and its durability make it ideal for transportation and building applications. Um, just last year, we finished a $300 million expansion at our Davenport, Iowa facility to make aluminum sheet products for the auto industry. Um, we added 300 brand new jobs in Davenport. Um, we're also working right now on an auto sheet facility in uh, Alcoa, Tennessee, near Knoxville. Uh, when that's completed at the end of this year, it will add 200 new jobs, advanced manufacturing jobs. And uh, during construction, it's supporting about 400 construction jobs. Um, another area where aluminum has been very prominent in uh, sustainable infrastructure has been in building and construction. I think you've heard a lot of discussion this morning about the impact of buildings on energy and energy consumption. Uh, about 70% of the electricity that is consumed in the United States is consumed by buildings. And they actually uh, are responsible for roughly 40% of the greenhouse gas that is emitted. Alcoa as a company is the leader in aluminum building applications that can save energy in buildings by as much as 50%, can save greenhouse gas emissions, and can actually help buildings achieve green building standards. And uh, we heard a lot about climate change. Uh, our panelists talked about the weather issues with respect to climate change. That's bringing a growth in new products like hurricane-resistant buildings. Uh, we've now got a building panel, uh, a framing system, that can withstand impacts from objects of up to 250 miles an hour. Uh, again, just responding to some of the risks that climate change brings for us. Impressive. I, I hope we don't see winds of 250 miles an hour, except on a high-speed train. But I hope you're in an Alcoa building if you do. Exactly. <laughs> or, or from a Republican <coughs> senator. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, Mike. I, As I said, no comment there, Leo. Uh, Mike, what's how about steel? A lot of our infrastructure, bridges, railroads are made out of steel. What's your thoughts well, on that? Well, first, first is that um, I'm also the chairman of the American Iron and Steel Institute. I was here last week for uh, when all the steel CEOs get together. But Leo is absolutely correct. We can talk about growth of jobs, growth in manufacturing, and the renaissance around energy, and the renaissance around improving our infrastructure in, in the U.S. and Canada, but that's not going to be our renaissance for the American worker if it's, if it's the uh, foreign imports are enjoying this renaissance. And we've got to stop it. It's, it's huge, and we've got to stop it. And Leo is, uh, Leo is partnered with the CEOs on this effort, and because uh, we've got to stop it. it, and we only stop it together. This is not one person's effort or one group's effort because 
these are taking away, these antiquated trade laws are taking away good paying jobs because we have not been able to slow it down and hopefully we'll get some legislation to do it, but we've got to push from all the angles to do that. So I've got off my soapbox with that. And so next, you, you asked about what is Avraz doing. Avraz is interesting in that uh, uh, we, uh, we acquired the Pueblo, Colorado facility a few years back. Pueblo has been in the business for 140 years. And we learned very early on after acquiring the mill that you need to invest in your people and invest in your infrastructure. And so we also learned that uh, to fight foreign imports, you've got to have the best technology. So what, our, what we've been able to do at Everest with a 140-year-old mill is have our people come up with a technology that no one else in the U.S. can do so that it can provide uh, uh, the hardened rail that's needed to transport, which is what 90% uh, of rail in the U.S. is for cargo. So our rail is the best. We know it. And what you said about coming down from New York today, we want to be able to produce that rail for, uh, for people moving, for high-speed rail when it comes. Let's don't let this be some uh, foreign import that enjoys high-speed rail. Let us provide our dependable, uh, quality-produced rail to do that. Great. Well, and I look forward to when Amtrak is fast and smooth. <laughs> Leo, you've often talked about the fact that in a global economy, pollution is also global. When we offshore our manufacturing, but then with the prevailing winds, we get the pollution right back. How can we make sure that, and the U.S. standards are often much higher, how can we make sure that this infrastructure rebuild, if it happens, and we're going to talk about how we get there, creates high quality and American jobs. Well, look, I think uh, I, I do want to, uh, before I do that, praise Alcoa and uh, Mike as the CEO of AISI. Metal, Alcoa's metal, aluminum, steel, are the two most highly recycled products on the, in the country, on the planet. And, and it, it, it's, if, it, if, it, if you do the life expectancy of the recycled, they're actually contributing to, to reducing energy and reducing carbon by recycling that material. The problem also is that then two of the largest exports out of America to China are waste paper and metal. China has decided that they want to control the recycled paper mill business, so they will pay almost any price for recycled paper anywhere west of the Mississippi, which has led to the closing of a number of our recycled paper mills. So when you ask that question, the whole issue is around if we're going to negotiate agreements of any kind, they have to have strong and enforceable worker standards, strong and enforceable environmental standards. They don't call it LA warming. They call it global warming. Well, to produce a ton of steel in China versus a ton of steel in America, we're going to produce three times the carbon emissions. That doesn't make sense. And so when, when we're going to look at the global economy if, as it sits, and we're going to negotiate new global agreements of whatever kind, environmental agreements, trade agreements, we need to have at least some kind of a border adjustment. If China's not going to make its standard and it wants to send something into the U.S., then it has to pay an economic penalty for not reaching the nationally accepted or internationally accepted global environmental standards. They can't get a free ride. And, and we've also got to, at that point in time, recognize that in all parts of the manufacturing sector, we've got to have some concern about what the other side is doing to meet international acceptable standards. Now, I heard from you today and I heard from Rich Trumka today about China's high-speed rail system. Uh, You're sick of hearing about China. No, I'm not sick. <laughs> I've been sick about China for a long time. The, 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 the reality, though, is America needs a made-in-America transportation strategy, and we need to make sure that we have mass transit, whether it's on rail or by bus, and by rail we can have 
efficient standards and we can make that rail in Pueblo, Colorado or somewhere else. We can build those cars in Pittsburgh or somewhere else. We can, we can look at whether we have aluminum or steel and fiber or something else. We can do all that stuff. What we lack is the political will. And I think for a number of people in this room who are going to go up on the hill in the next day or two, we need to make sure that we tell every member of Congress, if you don't get up off your ass and do something, you ain't going to get elected the next time. We're sick and tired. And, and, and we, should, we shouldn't sit in these rooms and answer questions without agreeing, at least, that there's a political problem when you have the richest country on earth having the most uh, regressive infrastructure strategy on the planet. And it's not because certain individuals like our president haven't tried, it's because certain individuals like the Republican Party have tried to stop everything we could on infrastructure, infrastructure banks, trade deals, and the whole deal. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend they're not the problem. Anyhow, they are the problem. They deserve to get their ass kicked out. <laughs> well, it's absolutely clear we have to work on this all together. Not only all the parties here, but as we said, all the parts of the government. Uh, Kathy, we've been talking a lot Kevin about. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, we've been talking a lot about metal. Uh, one important so, uh, place that goes is in pipelines or energy infrastructure. Tell us about why we need to focus on our gas and, infra and energy infrastructure. Wow, it's kind of hard to follow, kick their butts out into. <laughs> Let's talk about <laughs> pipeline I infrastructure. More than that. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's critical that we that we think about and talk about our gas pipeline infrastructure, uh, especially from a climate change perspective. Uh, methane is the primary component of natural gas. It's a very potent greenhouse gas. It's 25 times stronger at trapping heat than carbon dioxide, which we hear about all the time. The oil and gas industry uh, are the largest source of methane emissions in the United States, representing about 40% of the uh, total. And while it's true that natural gas burns cleaner than coal, fugitive emissions, leaks, uh, from, from, from the production site or from our pipeline infrastructure, really significantly reduces the climate benefits of trying to shift from a coal-based electricity uh, generation system to natural gas. Now, what I found interesting, I was reading recently uh, a study that was done by some researchers at Duke University and Boston University. They did a series of studies in different cities across the country looking at uh, methane leaks from the aging urban pipeline infrastructure. And I thought that some of the results were like absolutely eye-popping. Uh, in Boston, where I come from, uh, the study found 3,300 leaks. They were mostly tiny, uh, but in six locations they had gas levels that were higher than the threshold um, at which explosions occur. Wow. In D.C., where we're all sitting right now, the same study found 5,900 gas leaks. Again, a lot of them were tiny, but at 12 locations, all of them in manholes, uh, again, had levels of methane concentrations ten, some t 10 times the, the level that you need for an explosion. So here's what we need. We need stronger state and federal laws and regulations to reduce methane emissions from our natural gas production, processing, and distribution system in this country. If we get that, this will also help encourage utilities and policymakers make their own investments, I think, in upgrading and maintaining and monitoring and repairing our natural gas pipelines and all of the other infrastructure to meet the future energy demands that we're going to have in this country. And when you combine those sorts of investments with investments in infrastructure that supports renewable energy deployment, you really can slow the pace of climate change, you can grow new industries, and you can create good paying American jobs that cannot be outsourced. 
Mike, uh, before I turn to you, I do want to, why, by the way, thank you, Leo, for not commenting on explosive levels of gas in a certain building in D.C. Um, good of you to restrain yourself. Give it time. <laughs> Mike, a lot of the pipeline repair will be steel. Talk about the steel angle on that. Well, first off, you, you mentioned I was in the paper industry. For you paper guys out there, I, I'd argue paper is one of the most recycled products, too, now, buddy, okay? You know, along with steel. So we uh, 90 percent recycled. So, uh, so we have a great sustainability message in throughout this hall with paper and steel, too. So the, uh, on steel, the infrastructure spending is, is again, I want to make, I want to go what Leo is saying, is that uh, it is our renaissance. Again, we are, as ever, a big pipe producer in North America, one of the largest. But here's the problem, is that how do you ship our recycled material of steel to Turkey, go on a little boat over there, produce the steel in Turkey, ship it back on the boat, have it land in Houston, and at that point uh, be competitive with our products? Well, you can't. It means that, uh, that you've got an unregulated country that has poor, poor employment practices, poor pollution practices. They don't have what we have in this country. And so we need to protect that because we can do all we can about climate change, but we need to put these uh, manufacturing inside North America because we know we can have a sustainable environment. And so as far as the pipe infrastructure, um, it's massive. And so the Blue-Green Alliance, I think, is going to be on the front of this as far as talking to local municipalities about this, because uh, it can be done. It's going to need to be a campaign, and uh, I think we can get it done. Great. Uh, and now, moving forward, as we said, we've been saying again and again, it's going to take all of us. Kevin. You've been a real leader at ELCO on collaborative solutions, public-private partnerships and the like. Tell us about some of those, how we can really collaborate and form partnerships to move this infrastructure push forward more quickly. Well, I, we're all trying to solve sustainability problems. And let's face it, the really complex sustainability issues that we face today are beyond the individual capabilities of even the largest companies. This takes collaborative activity. It takes us working together. If we're going to find the innovative solutions that drive the social and environmental change that we need, um, government, NGOs, scientists, labor, companies, communities, we all have to have a seat at the table. Alcoa has been leading certain collaborative efforts. One that comes to mind, and Leo mentioned the recycling, um, we're very proud that aluminum as a material is, is very, very recyclable, and it will not lose its qualities in the recycle loop. Um, but we don't have enough recycling in the United States. Um, we started, Alcoa started a collaboration called Action to Accelerate Recycling. The purpose of this was to bring the entire packaging value chain together and to try to realize the value in recycling that no individual company could realize on its own. Um, even though we recycle 54% of the aluminum cans that are consumed in the U.S. every year, the other 46% end up in landfills. That's almost a billion dollars in value. When you look at other packages like glass and plastic PET bottles, the rates are even lower. Uh, glass bottles, about 33% get recycled. Plastic PET containers, about 29%. One of the biggest issues is lack of infrastructure to allow us to manage that closed loop recycle. Um, we really have to go after the infrastructure. Uh, a 20% improvement in recycling rates across all containers, not just aluminum, all containers, would drive billions of dollars in recovered value from material that's being thrown away today, would save millions of tons of greenhouse gas pollution, and would create good green jobs. 
I mean, that's the key. I mean, these kinds of collaborative efforts are possible. We just have to have the will, I think Leo said it, the political will to go after them. And we're going to need people to step up, people to take the initiative, people to lead these, and, and we're going to need everybody to join together because we can't do it alone. So uh, I'm going to ask one question to, to all of you now. I used to work, as Dave said, for the city of New York and doing environmental law, worked with a lot of uh, managers from cities who worked in water and sewage and uh, environmental aspects. And they were all frustrated because they could never get their mayor to care about this stuff until, as they said, the sewer line broke in their backyard on Thanksgiving. <laughs> and then the mayor was mad at them. Uh, but a lot of the infrastructure is invisible. How can we, all of us here, and this is my question for all of you, work to get attention on infrastructure, not just in Congress, but in state houses and in city halls now, before bridges collapse even more, schools fall down, drinking water gets people sick, or sewage lines break on Thanksgiving? What can we do to get attention on this right now? Leah, we'll start with you. Well, um I guess what's going through my mind is uh, a couple of, of comments I've heard over the years, and maybe I'll regurgitate them. Uh, one is build it and they will come. The other is success has many parents, failures, and orphan. Uh, and last but certainly not least, a friend once said to me, uh, an old proverb that he said, unless you change direction, you will continue in the direction in which you are heading. And if you put those three things together, clearly we can't keep doing what we've been doing. And I think that uh, part of why uh, a few of us wanted to create the Blue-Green Alliance is uh, we wanted to, to challenge some of the false dichotomies that were there. The one that we heard all the time, especially when I was growing up, is you can't have both a clean environment and good jobs. Uh, and I believe that's absolutely untrue. You're either going to have both or in the long run we'll have neither. And uh, the, other, the other piece of that, I guess, is that uh, maybe Kevin was alluding to it. There's no one organization. There's no one movement. There's no one environmental group. There's no one labor group. There's no uh, any individual organization that can challenge, take on and challenge this direction we're going in by themselves. Part of the reason we created the Blue-Green Alliance is so we could broaden the coalition. And I think once we have seen what we can do in the Blue-Green Alliance, we need to now have the Blue-Green Alliance make other alliances, uh, maybe with the anti-poverty movement and the civil rights movement, because a clean environment is a civil rights issue. And, 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 and take, take on those challenges. But again, that uh, Mike made a point about collaboration. And this is the first time in the seven years since we created the Blue-Green Alliance that we've had the focus on this conference called Repair America. Uh, we educate the people in this room. As I said earlier today, they've got to go back. They're the vanguard. They've got to go back and educate the people. Some of them ought to run for city council. Some of them ought to run for school board. Some of them ought to run for mayor and get into those circumstances and bring the knowledge. And, and my own personal passion is that uh, I hope to someday be able to sit in my lazy boy chair, which, by the way, is made by steelworkers, so it's a good chair to sit in, and uh, sit, sit, in, sit in that lazy boy chair and have my grandson's son sitting on my knee and knowing that because what we've done over the last, in that time, be the next 20 years, that uh, we've created a better environment for our kids and grandkids. We owe it to them to leave the planet better than we found it. All right, Kevin, over to you. What can we do to get infrastructure a, a to hot topic of discussion at every level of government? I, I knew I shouldn't have sat in this chair because I have to follow Leo, and he's always so eloquent, so. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I think, I think um, it is finding new collaboration models. It really is, and it is, it is working together on the issues that we've not been able to come together on before. 
I mean, infrastructure requires investment, and that's the hardest part of it. It takes money. So we have to come up with the right models for investment and the right models for governance so that we can free up investment to drive infrastructure improvements. Um, there are lots of models out there today that are inventive, creative, innovative, that people are, are trying. One, one that Alcoa is involved in right now is one that the Department of Energy started. It's called uh, Better Buildings, Better Plants Initiative. And what they're trying to do is get companies to commit to put their locations, their industrial operations, in this program and drive really substantial energy improvements. Uh, Alcoa's got 29 locations in the U.S. in this program, and so far, over the last few years, we've been able to drive about a 12% overall improvement in energy efficiency at those locations. I mean, that's a fantastic collaborative process with government involved, with labor involved, with companies involved. So those are the kinds of things I think that we need. That's a good idea. I should say we were, NRDC was very involved in trying to create a green bank in New York State, and uh, we are hopeful that that model will be one piece of an infrastructure support network that will take, take root and spread to the other states. Mike, how about you? Well, my, uh, <laughs> my thoughts are always simple. I'm from Alabama, okay? <laughs> so, um, and it's real simple. And the message is, is that those of us that have a presence here in Washington, we need to be loud. And I ask you the, in the local uh, communities, you need to have a loud, knowledgeable, reasonable voice. If you're not loud, it's hard to work here in Washington. And so the local level needs to be loud. It needs to be loud about that city that's, that have the infrastructure. Be loud. We'll hear it in Washington. And that's my message. You got to be loud. You might have heard this morning, some of you, um, and many of us are working on uh, really trying to amplify the voices of cities. Because even while a lot is uh, seeming paralyzed in this city, in other cities, there's really a lot of action going on. Mayors and governors are not sitting still. Uh, and so certainly, I think that's right. Working with your locals, government and others, and helping them be loud can be very persuasive. Totally agree. Kathy? Well, I, l I like the, the be loud message. Uh, I, also, I also like the idea of ensuring that we have multiple voices um, representing multiple constituencies talking and talking loud. I think uh, all, all of us need to be aware and help our friends, families, neighbors be aware that you know, too often we take our infrastructure for granted, right? We flip the switch, we expect the lights to go on. You know, we turn on the faucet, we expect clean water to come out. We're, we're commuting to work and we expect that, you know, the, the transportation system is going to get us quickly or that the road's going to be there and not buckled or broken away. Um, and I think that we all can play a role in helping our, our friends, family, neighbors, and our local policymakers connect the dots between what's happening on the ground relating to the impacts of climate change that we feel as people and as families and as communities, but that are affecting the infrastructure that we talked about. And then at the same time, making sure that um, we have people that are bringing sort of the economic, connecting the dots to the economic arguments that we've talked about. And, and helping our local policymakers understand that what they're understand what they're spending right now uh, in order to uh, respond to events that have happened or prepare for uh, infrastructure impacts that are going to happen, or what they could possibly generate uh, and bring into the community with new jobs, clean jobs, um, infrastructure repair jobs. So, I think. Helping people connect the dots, all of us, helping people connect the dots, and as you say, be loud and be many. Yeah, as you said, making the invisible visible and known. One of the interesting things is we're struggling so often with pollution and other disease here because it's often, it happens 10 years later or it's invisible. So our job is to make people really understand what's going on. 
So before we close, I'm giving Leo, as the organizer, a, a, a one-minute opportunity. I, uh, I want to do a confession, I guess. I've been running my mouth for a long time, and uh, we decided uh, last year that the steelworkers had to put up or shut up. So uh, we're retrofitting our building. It's going to become a LEED certified building. We're going to spend about $6 million, but we're going to recoup that. Don't clap yet. We're going to, rec we're going to recoup that. This is the message I'm sending to those that can do this. Uh, we're going to recoup that investment over roughly 15 years. That's a better return on investment than if we were buying government bonds. And so that, that, could, that can make a big difference. The last thing I want to do is I want to thank Peter Lerner. Uh, Peter, at the head of his organization, was one of the first environmental organizations to come and join the Blue-Green Alliance after we've created it, and he brings a strong voice to our meetings. I want to thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure. <clears throat> and so I want to close by thanking all of you for being here. As you've heard, it's really important that your voice be loud, be targeted, and please don't let up. We've got too much is at stake. Thank you all for being with us. <clears throat>